Hey, what's going on, chat? Welcome to another episode of Live Recon. If this is your first time watching, welcome. Uh, if you know what Live Recon is, this is where I bring on a guest every week where we either interview them, uh, have them show off their recon, uh, show off their tools, or uh, a combination of both. If you're watching this on YouTube, when it goes live, when you see the VOD, uh, if you want to come watch one of these live, you can watch it on uh, Twitch, twitch.tv slash Nahamsek every Sunday at 11.30 PT Pacific time. I put 11. What's that pentestical? All right. Um, I don't have any real announcements today other than activity cons over. Thank God. Uh, kind of glad it's over now since it was a lot of work, but can't complain. Um, if you are here for the course, you can use the Udemy command. Um, I think the code right now, it's activity. If you haven't purchased it, you can use it, uh, to get a copy of, uh, my Udemy course. If you're new to hacking and want to learn, uh, more about bug bounty, uh, other than that business per usual, I'm still trying to figure out how I can push myself to stream more. I really want to get back into doing Fridays. I have an idea of what I want to do. I just haven't done it yet. Um, so you can see my headphone reflection. Man, you guys are looking at everything. You guys can see my screen through my headphone reflection. All right. Um, all right. So out of curiosity, in the chat, how many of you guys watched ActivityCon and uh, Dylan's talk specifically? And how many of you guys actually have used Truffle Hog? I know a lot of people in bug bounties and like red teamers use Truffle Hog very religiously, but out of the you know hundred and something people that are currently watching, I would like to hear from you guys if you've used Truffle Hog. Um, and if you did watch the talk that uh, Dylan did during ActivityCon. And actually, Action, thank you so much for that 30 bits. Ignite, thank you so much for that tier one sub for 19 months, man. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for uh, supporting the stream. Been using the extension. It's pretty sweet. Dope, dope. Well, hopefully, uh, Dylan could give us a little bit more insight on his tool. Uh, maybe we can do a quick uh, demo of his tool later, too. But we'll see. All right. Is it time for the interview? Chat, you ready? You guys are quiet today. All right, let's welcome Dylan, aka Insecure Nature, and bring him on to the stream. Hey, man, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Doing good. Uh, a little bit behind today, unfortunately. Um, All good. Usually go get breakfast earlier, but I, I couldn't wake up today and make myself get out of bed early, so I can make sure I of sleep. So I kind of like pushed everything back for a, for a few minutes. But how are you doing, man? Thank you so much for being here on a Sunday and, you know, giving your time to us to uh, talk hacking and recon with us. No, I'm doing well and uh, totally hear you on the sleep side. Imagine after all the activity con, you're, you're due for a good night's sleep. So it makes sense. Yeah, I didn't get to sleep, unfortunately, the Saturday after activity con. And then I've been doing more stuff throughout the week. So sleep has been deprioritized, you know, you know how it goes sometimes. That's how it goes. <laughs> Well, uh, for people that aren't familiar with you, uh, give us a quick TLDR of who you are, uh, how long have you been doing this, and like, uh, what's your background like? Yeah, so I've been in the security community for probably about a decade. Um, mostly see myself as a security researcher, spoken yeah. at uh, a number of large conferences like DEF CON, Black Hat, that kind of thing. Um, also see myself as a little bit of an open source evangelist. Um, I went to school at a school that actually had the first open source program. Uh, it was an open source minor at the time. Uh, it got, kind of what got me into it originally. Um, and also see myself as a bit of a civic hacker. And so uh, sometimes what I, what I do is work on hackathons and things like that that are for local government and for uh, civic good, basically. Yeah, so she went to... Um... So you went to a school that, that had an open source program. Did you go to school specifically for cybersecurity too, or was it just, uh, how did cybersecurity come into play? No, um, I actually went to school for computer engineering. Um, 
I first got into security with the first internship I did. I went to uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, and they kind of require yeah. that you do a certain number of internships to graduate. Um, so it just so happened that the the first uh, internship I did, uh, or actually second internship I did, um, was at a pen testing company, and that was that nice. was kind of how I learned how to hack. Um, so was that your first? Um like exposure to hacking is that how you got into hacking or were you hacking prior to college and like you know, dabbling in hacking before college? No, I mean, that was the first exposure. Uh, I was doing some, some Bitcoin stuff in college. Um, we, I had access to FPGAs through my, uh, computer engineering background. And so, um, okay. was one of the first couple of folks to port, uh, the Bitcoin mining algorithm over to an FPGA at the time. But uh, but really on the the web application pen testing side of things uh, that that came through that internship, and that was back at the the top of the last decade. So before bug bounties were really popular, and before um, you know most most companies had disclosure programs, um, was when I, I learned how to pen test a web application, uh, which was a wild experience back then because then you'd go out after your day job to just use the internet and just realize that every single one of these websites you're browsing has vulnerabilities and there's no way to disclose them. And you just have to sit on that and you have to realize that there's this asymmetry of, of knowledge gap that just hadn't, you know, hit the mainstream yet. Um, but that, that was my background. That's kind of how I learned. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned bug bounties. Did you, uh, do you participate in bug bounties? Yeah, no, I've been, uh, I've been involved, um, in the bug bounty scene for a little while, um, okay. not really uh, as active as I think a lot of other people are, but um, one third place with uh, Google's VRP uh, vulnerability nice. submission Very last cool. year as part of a uh, Google Cloud uh, security research I did, presented at uh, DEF CON last year on that. Um, also for a little while, I was writing top 100 um, bug bounty submitters on Bug Crowd, um, but that was a number of years ago. and. I uh, couldn't keep up with that. Too many new hackers entered the space and didn't have enough time to <laughs> stay up there. It's very time consuming, man. It's uh, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of time to you know stay at the top of that game, especially with how many people are involved now and how many programs are out there. And uh, it's a completely different game now. Um, so you mentioned you went to college, you did computer science, um, then you did an internship for a pen test place. Um, did you get any certificates throughout the years? Do you have any certs, OSCP, OSWE, anything? No, um, no. So I've never gotten any certs. Um, and it was computer engineering, uh, which is a little different from computer science. Yeah, yeah. It's more hardware focused. Hardware science. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I don't have anything against certs. I just have never really explored that path. I don't actually yeah. know a tremendous amount about the process. And so. Um, I know people are very zealoted about, you know, pro cert or anti cert, but um, I've just kind of not really uh, been involved with it one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, um, the cert thing is, I, I would like to hear people's backgrounds. I'm with you. I, I've never, I, I want to get OSCP at some point just so I can feel more legit, if that makes sense, just to have that piece of shiny paper that says, hey, I've passed this, you know, industry standard test. But, um, I think it's and there's also the other side of it that a lot of people have these certs but don't know how to do 90% of the things that they learned. They took the test and then they completely forgot about it or they didn't practice it, whatever it was. Um, but it's just mostly to understand, you know, people that are building out tools, people that are pen testing, you know, they're, you know, you said your top three at Google VRP for a little bit, you did top bug route for a top 100 for bug route. Uh, what's your background like? Like, how did you learn? So it looks like search wasn't a thing for you, but how did you? How did you get into like web hacking? How did you learn um, web hacking and I got better at it? Yeah, I mean, so that's that's mostly been through uh, my day job, but with a little bit of um, research peppered into the side. Um, yeah. So for a little while I was doing consulting and then I started doing um, uh, in-house security for a couple of large companies. So I was working at Salesforce for a little while. Most recently I was working on the Netflix application security team. Um, so you learn you know, how to do web hacking at, at those companies, but it's just a little bit different of a perspective. And I've kind of had to fill some of the gaps um, with some independent research on the side. Yeah, but when do you um, do independent research on the side, when you see a new technique comes out or you want to learn a new bug class or get better at it, how do you, how do you get to that point? How, what, what do you use to get to that point? 
Like, how do I find out about it? Or how do you practice it? How do you get better at, you know, someone that wants to learn XSS, you know, how did you learn about XSS and how did you get better at it? How did you practice to get better at it? What were the resources? Yeah, I mean, so for me, that was mostly through consulting. Um, yeah. You know, the way uh, the way it was really common back uh, 10 years ago um, when I first started getting into it was, uh, you know, if somebody had a website and they wanted to pen test it, they'd pay a consultant $10,000 for that consultant to hammer on it for a week. And then we get their report and that would be that. Um, nowadays, like a lot of this is crowdsourced, like, you know, and, and through bug bounty yeah. platforms and responsible disclosure and all that stuff. But um, but back then it was, it was much more concentrated. Uh, and that's, that's the way I, I learned it was basically, um, somebody would, uh, con uh, contract from my firm and, uh, I would just hammer on, on a particular website for a week. And then I would have uh, more experienced people alongside me, uh, teaching me how to do it and showing me all the, the tips and tricks and stuff like that. And, and that's kind of how it started. And I think from there, um, I, uh, you know, in, in my own free time, we'll browse uh, NetSec and, and Hacker Twitter yeah. and things like that and try to stay up on top of things. I think Twitter is such an underrated tool that a lot of people aren't utilizing to just stay up to date, not even to learn anything, but it's just, what are, you gonna, what are people going to post their research? It's either Twitter or um, Reddit, right? I think Twitter was one of the things that really, really helped me out um, throughout my days. Um, what about programming do you have a do you think for someone who wants to get into hacking or becomes who wants to become a hacker a web hacker mostly you know for bug bounties uh do you think that they need to know how to code um what's your take on it no that's that's a good question i mean i i'm, I'm hesitant to use the word need um but i do think yeah. in general um you know, high school kids are, are learning how to code these days as part of their normal school routine. Like it's it's just becoming a, a a part of the standard. Like you come to the job market, like people kind of expect that you have some little bit of experience there. And so, you know, I have no doubt yeah. that you could be a successful uh, bug bountier and find lots of bugs without that coding experience. But I would definitely recommend having a little bit of that um, because it's going to make you just such a better hacker and make you much more competitive on the job market and allow you to open up so many more doors you wouldn't know the rise of access to. Yeah, I think uh, the, the word need is what makes it tricky because you don't think you need anything uh, other than a laptop, some decent Wi-Fi and, you know, unlimited amount of time to spend on the computer. Uh, but I think uh, with coding or, you know, becoming a knowing how to code, it's the understanding of things you have to assume about the application, it's either you're assuming the wrong things and then you keep assuming until you learn, you know, two years later you learn based on how many assumptions you have made and your success rate, you, you know, you learn how to assume those things or you rely on your, um, your experience because you have done these things. You have deployed apps on your own. You have used these, um, you know, pipelines of places that people, you know, integrate quote or I uh, use to deploy code and you get to understand it. Um, but you necessarily don't need it in order to become good. It's just you need to understand how things work. Uh, I personally think it doesn't hurt to know some scripting and you know a little bit of JavaScript so you can read some of it. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's not a need, but it it doesn't hurt. The more you know, it's better for you, right? The more stuff you have on your tool, but the more, the, the more you can do. Yeah, absolutely. And the more specialized you get as well, like the better you're going to be at hacking in that niche because like, you know, bug bountying is, is a competition, right? Whether right. or not we want it to be like, you're going after the same bugs other people are and it's first to submit. And so if you become really, really good at a particular vertical, like GraphQL or something like that, mm -hmm. you're just going to be able to cut down on all of that competition because nobody's going that deep on that particular vertical that you're specialized in. And so whatever that is, whether that's programming or infrastructure or DevOps or front end engineering, um, definitely having that extra specialty um, right. is going to allow you to just stand out and find those those more deep bugs that other people aren't looking for. For sure. Yeah. The I think bug bounties are just about being in the right niche or the right new area or whatever that is and being ahead of the game by knowing how things work. Uh, do you play CTFs? I haven't in a long time, um, but I have in the past. Uh, okay. I, uh, 
I, I don't think uh, they're they're really my thing, <laughs> but yeah. I have uh, you know I have participated in them, and I do enjoy you know when you've got a group of your friends sitting around all working on the same thing and getting getting that euphoria rush of finally figuring it out. Um, but especially kind of in COVID times, where you know you kind of have to do it alone and it's not as social, um, yeah. I haven't really uh, haven't really done that in a while. Do you think, based on your experience with CTFs? Has it helped you any way with hacking and bug bounties at all? I don't actually think it's helped a whole lot. Um, I think uh, usually the challenges um, in CTFs are um, they're they're kind of fun and very very niche, and I don't know if they necessarily always the one to one apply with uh, the types of bugs you'll find in bug bounties. Um, uh, I know a, a good friend of mine. His name is Cheston, and he does the uh, Hack Fortress at DEF CON every year. And he had one of my favorite um, CTF challenges. Um, basically, what it was, so Cheston is uh, you know, running Hack Fortress, and he's responsible for organizing a whole bunch of the the different challenges. One of the challenges was the social engineering challenge, and so he's got um, booty shorts on and a big <laughs> fat wallet, and he stuck the wallet out the back of the booty shorts. There's more wallet than shorts at this point. And then he's just going around dancing around everybody, just trying to get people to steal his wallet because that's where the flag was. Um, so stuff like that is is fun. Um, but you know, I'd uh, I'd be very surprised if you be able to get a buck bounty from stealing somebody's wallet out their booty shorts. But de- I mean, definitely call it out on Twitter if if you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a CTF site. Defcon CTF where you just have to know stuff and you just gotta get better at them on the go. But I think there are some CTFs you can use to learn, you know, just uh like try hack me, hack the box. They're not really CTFs or hacker one on one, they're like hybrid CTFs. It's there's a solution there, you gotta figure it out, but who knows how you gotta figure it out. But also I think I always see I always say this. <laughs> Someone in the chat's calling it capture the booty. Um I always say CTFs are a good place to learn what you want to do like you're new to infosec you're new to hacking go play a ctf see what you're passionate about what category makes you excited that you want to learn more about and that's your niche that's where you start uh, that's a good place to kind of you know get that uh experience if that makes sense yeah definitely and uh and i don't have a tremendous amount of experience with all those different types of ctfs you listed off so the experiences with those are probably different than the ones that i have with def and um, stuff like that sure uh, let's talk about hacking a little bit uh do you do do you do a lot of recon so this is a live recon stream um we have to talk recon a little bit do you do a lot of recon when you do uh, bug bounties or hacking yeah definitely and i have a couple of uh tips and tricks that i don't know if they've hit the mainstream quite yet that i'm happy to to share off as well cool let's uh let's jump into the recon push what does recon mean to you before we do that yeah so um I mean, what, what I think is kind of funny is when you have a, you know, a hacker join an in-house security team. Sometimes I think they can struggle a little bit with um, figuring out how to how to recon from the other side, because yeah. when you're working in-house at a, a security company, like you could just do a zone transfer. You could just get the list of all the DNS records, right? You don't need to yeah. play all these games, run all these scripts, or you could ask for a whiteboarding session with an SRE or something, and just have them explain how it all works. Um, but so, so recon is really the other side of that coin, right? It's when you don't have that engineer to explain how it all works. It's when you don't have that zone transfer. It's like, how do you still get those DNS records, even right. though there's not just an API you can hit to return them all? Yeah, um, recon, I mean, it depends. But for the bug bounty, it's mostly the, the DNS records is the golden part. But I think it goes beyond just the DNS records when it comes down to hacking, it's just understanding the organization, what assets do they own, how do they name stuff, uh, where do they put stuff, where's their corporate environment, where's their internal environment, you know, where's the dev environment, uh, who deploys that, who's been at the company, who's gone, all that stuff. But you're nailing on the head when you work internally for a company, the recon part portion is really easy. You have access to stuff uh, versus being on the offensive side, being on the outside, like a bug bounty hunter, then it's a different, completely different ball game. What tools do you usually use when it comes down to recon? Yeah, um, so that's uh, that's a really good point that you mentioned before too. And I think like a lot of times, what I used to do in bug bounties was, you know, you mentioned the internal piece. 
um, a lot of these recon tools will just look for attack surface area, yeah. like what's on the outside, and then they'll just ignore everything that's on the inside. Like if it doesn't have that port open or it doesn't re you know, respond with DNS or whatever, um, to just throw it away and only focus on the things that are like right there on the attack surface. I used to flip that on its head though, um, because you've got this trove of internal applications that you can't directly hit but if you see one of those applications is an open source tool, like let's say you see Jenkins.internalName.com or something yeah. like that, um, all you need is a reflected cross-site scripting or a CSERF or something like that. And now you've got a link that you can weaponize against that internal asset. And, and you could submit that to the bug bounty and, and you oftentimes, you know, they'll, they'll recognize it as an issue and pay it out. So you've got all these internal assets, many of which are running open source tools that you can pull down the source code for and turn into a total uh -huh. white box test. Um, and then any of the bugs that you find, as long as they're triggerable from like a link or from external or something like that, um, it's still a big problem for the organization and sometimes worse even. Um, and I mentioned Jenkins before, like if you go on the CVE database list for Jenkins and you pull it up by severity, they put reflected cross-site scriptings as the lowest severity possible. They're all like low, 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 low. And they've had years and years of cross-site scripting problems. Yeah. But the reality is if you have that reflected cross-site scripting for that Jenkins, that's a remote code execution. Somebody clicks that, you can use that to hit the script console yeah. and immediately just run code. And now you've got code running on one of the most sensitive things um, on the inside of their environment. So it's automatically more salacious than something on the outside. So, you know, when we're talking about recon tools, um, I, I make sure that the tools I use will also like hang on to those internal assets. Okay. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I like to do is I try to find that internal domain name. And sometimes that's a little bit of manual effort and a little bit of scripting through something like GitHub or like through the yeah. mobile application or something like that. Yeah. Always with mobile apps, uh, they've got their internal endpoint and their external endpoint, and it's always all packaged into the same app. And there's just a Boolean that flips it from one to the other. So you reverse that APK and you can immediately find that internal domain name that way. Um, same thing with GitHub. I've actually used Trufflehog for this. Um, Trufflehog, you know, under the hood, if you look at it, is just running a bunch of patterns against all of the revision history in a repo. And so if you bring your own patterns to the table, you can just tweak it to instead of look for secrets, you tell it to look for domain names. And now yeah. it's pulling all the domain names from all the old history and stuff. Um, and you get all the internal domains that way because before stuff gets open sourced, it's wired up to the internal stuff. And then they remove all that stuff and they open source it. But if that history is still there, you can still tell that story and you can still read the internal stuff and you can read all the references to internal wikis and stuff like that. Um, another tool I like to use is a tool put out by a friend of mine. His name is Ian Foster called CertGraph. Okay. Um, basically what CertGraph does, um, most people are familiar with certificate transparency. Uh, but what's interesting is like a lot of times a certificate will have multiple domain names on it. So it'll get logged in certificate transparency. It's just a thing that anybody can query. And then it's yeah. got all the different domain names on it. Well, CertGraph will recursively for all of those domains, go out and pull all of those certificates and then see what domain names are on those certificates. Yeah. And then it'll just spider out like that and just find any affiliated domains that started with your base domain because people throw multiple domains on the same right. cert. Mm -hmm. Um, so you run that tool and you get like a big surface area of certificates that are just kind of tangentially related and then kind of building off of that. Um, one thing that I used to do is like within a certificate, um, you've got fields that a lot of people don't pay attention to like location, for example, yeah. I worked at Netflix. Netflix is based out of Los Gatos. There are not a lot of tech companies in Los Gatos. So you pull up the location field on the certificate, you see that it says Los Gatos, and then you can literally connect to this URT.sh database directly. Just pull like, the location out. And just query it by Los Gatos, and you've got the entire list of, of Netflix domains, more or less. Um, so a couple tricks like that. Um, there's a few other tricks as well. Like um, a lot of times um, a domain or like a, a website will be fronted um, with a CDN or a firewall or something yeah. like that. 
But the website on the other side is very often still internet facing. It's just when you go to the main domain, you're hitting it through the CDN or through the firewall. And so uh, one trick that I used to do is like you take some string that's really unique to that website and you look it up in Shodan and then you find uh, the real either, IP. either the one that's behind the firewall or some dev version of it running somewhere. And now you've got the ability to test that thing without the firewall dropping all the, you know, dot gits or, you know, looking for cross-site scriptings and dropping them or mm -hmm. rate limits or things like that. Um, Another one, and this one is Wait, before we move on to that, when you say a unique string, because people that are watching, they want to, because I know this is going to happen in the comments at some point. The unique string, you mean it could be a header, it could be a something in the response, it could be um, anything that comes back in the response. I could identify this website as unique to it. Usually, the header is one of the easiest ones to identify. Uh, but I want to kind of explain that for people that are going to ask, hey, how do you do that? It's just you look at the response, you pull something that's super unique to them. And you throw it in Shodan, and Shodan's really good at spotting it right away. Yeah, thanks for calling that out. Um, yeah, and there's other tools as well. Um, also, like some people just scan the entire internet, um, which <laughs> yep. uh, you know is, is becoming easier and easier to do. So if if you have that unique string, you could you could just do what Shodan does under the hood, yep. which is just search it all yourself. Um, yeah, and the last one I was going to call out. Um, this one is interesting because this is where it kind of crosses the line from like, um, you know, is this bug bounty and recon or is this like um, red team recon or I, I don't really know what it is, but yeah. um, tools like virus total and packet yep. total, um, they have public API endpoints to query some data, but if you pay them enough, and this is usually obscene amounts of money you need to pay them, they will expose the ability to actually download all of the raw samples that are uploaded to them, which just gives you so much more access than what's available via public API. They also have the ability to write Yara rules against all of their samples. And so you could do something like um, you know, a complex if conditional rule for a given sample. Um, and if anybody at that organization uploaded, you know, some test version of the code or some early version of the mobile app or something like that, um, and, and you're paying for this level of access to virus total, it'll actually let you download that entire version of that mobile app um, yeah. that was uploaded to virus total. And it's, it's not available to the general public, but if you work for a company that's paying for that level of access, or, you know, you just have a mountain of cash that you're sitting on and you're able to pay for that level of access. Um, it's kind of ridiculous how much data they'll actually give to you. Yeah. I think um, some of these, the, the something I've realized is like when with bug bounties, you make a little bit of money reinvesting that into tools like that. It's a really good one. I try to use, uh, we did the whole scanning the entire internet for certs and that was really fun for a while, but it's, it's draining when you do it, you know, every week. Um, but paying for something like security trails has been very helpful. I don't, you know, I, I got a license for them through a sponsorship and just seeing their data and the amount of data they have, and they're willing to give that out to you through their uh, Surface browser was incredible. And I have, you know, diffing the results is a really good one. They don't diff results, just timestamp when they see things. But when we were scanning the internet with uh, static flow, we were actually like diffing the results and yeah. looking at the Netflix diffs and, you know, whatever other company diffs and see what popped up recently as of last week to this week. Yeah, I think Risk IQ is maybe another good example of these threat intel companies that just have so much data. And if you pay yeah. them a little bit, they'll give you more access. But Risk IQ is a passive DNS provider. And so they have some tap and internet infrastructure and they're watching yeah. every unencrypted DNS query fly over that wire and they're logging them all. Um, if you go onto their service, I think they give you something like five free searches per day or something like that. And you can search for those records. But if you pay them more, um, then you have unlimited queries and you can do all kinds of weird, um, you know, searches on who is records and things like that. They actually index all of those fields. And so if there's a field on a who is record, you can reverse search it and it'll give you all the other who is records. Um, and, and I think that's really, uh, since you mentioned like paying to, to up your game, um, I guess that kind of speaks a little bit to privilege as well as people who come from that, you know, background and, and privilege and wealth to be able to pay for those tools have kind of an unfair advantage in that way. Um, 
and that's not just for tools as well. It's also the way you test. Um, yeah. People who want to hack on Tesla cars, uh, you know, if you want to do it right, you need a car, right? Yeah. Um, it opens up a lot more functionality. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, recon is just a cool thing to just, you know, for me, at least person to see people's perspective on how they do recon. Majority of the work is the same. It's just how they get it done. Um, if you're up for it, if you want to um, pull up, uh, maybe we can pull up start that stage and look at that uh, location query really quickly. Yeah. Um, you can share your screen at the bottom of the screen and then um, we can take a look really quickly. Because I'm curious to see how that looks for, I've always thought to use a location, but I've never thought of any companies that I would work with. But you make a valid point. Netflix is a really good one with the location thing because they are the only company that I can think of in that city. Let me uh, see what I can do here. I never uh, used this casting tool before, so hopefully this all works. That's pretty, um, pretty similar to Google Hangouts. It's just a little bit different. All right, let's see if I can add you to this. There we go. Yes, yeah, hopefully none of my old coworkers get upset for doing this. That's what <laughs> doing this hey man, someone may find something on their program and uh, it may work out in their favor. It's true. Yeah, I used to hack on their program before they hired me. <laughs> so uh, you never know where where that stuff takes you. But um, so if we just jump into one of these certificates, I think most of them have it. We'll just take a look at this widgets one. Um, and none of this was like rehearsed ahead of time. And so hopefully we don't have to click into a bunch of these looking for this. But yeah, location Los Gatos. So all you do is CRT.sh. I think it's the same domain. You can convert it over, uh, over Postgres. So if you just run like a local uh, SQL client, you can connect to it via Postgres and you can okay. query these fields directly. Um, so you just craft a query that looks for string matches on Los Gatos for the location field. Interesting. Um, and then it'll just return all the results for you. I think search that decision allows you to do searches based on a bunch of these um, different terms too. Some of them. Yeah, some of right. them. I don't think their UI lets you search on location, though. If we go to, go to advanced, advanced yeah. it kind of opens it up a little bit. Yeah, it's a little limited here. Um, but they give you raw access to the database. That gives you a lot more flexibility. I got to look into that. That's a really interesting one to look at and see what comes up for uh, Netflix specifically. Yeah, there's other ones that have uh, location as well, like... Um, you know, like Duo is based out of uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, yeah. Indeed is based out of Austin, Texas. And so, you know, some of those are not completely unique, but but also like um, it, it lets you filter it a lot. Yeah, um, this whole OSINT thing is interesting to see how, how much information you can get. It's the same thing, you know, the certificate feels like the same. It's just how different people use it. Uh, email address was one that I was really curious for for a while, but also realize like sometimes it's inaccurate. It's not a good enough place to look at. Um, but location, I gotta I gotta connect to this thing and figure it out at some point. Um, not to switch topics, I want to talk about Truffle Hog a little bit too. You just did a um, talk at ActivityCon and you released the um, the Chrome extension version of it, and you had some really cool. A really cool concept on uh, doing things with the archives, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to hear about it. What? Uh, let's talk about the background of Truffle Hog. What? Um, how long ago did you create Truffle Hog? So that was back in uh, late 2016, early 2017, something like that. Um, okay. And that was more or less, um, you know, it's a time of unemployment for me when I was sitting on a couch doing bug bounties, um, and I just come from an organization that where I had to kind of find keys that people had committed and clean them up and stuff like that. But I noticed at that time, there wasn't really good tooling to go through all the old history. Um, and so I did a little bit of research and found about half of your code usually is buried in the past. Yeah. Um, and that's only worse for older projects. And so, you know, if you have half the code buried in the past, it means half your secrets are buried in the past too. And so that's really what, what the, the original purpose for that tool was, is to go through all that old history and find that half of those secrets that weren't being found up until that point. Um, and I did a little bit of bug banning with it and then decided to, to open source the tool and give it back to the community. And then it kind of um, took off in popularity from there. What, um, what, new um functionality have you added into it since 2016 has there been any change since 2016 to 2021 
Yeah, you know, there's been a number of changes um, up to up to 2020, and then in 2021, um, what we did was we actually started to work on a whole bunch of features all at once because I jumped in full time to work on this, yeah. uh, and we're going to start open sourcing those like crazy over the next couple of months. So make sure you're you're following us on uh, on Twitter at TruffleSec um, or following uh, myself and Secure Nature because. We're definitely going to announce them out publicly, but it's it's super exciting, um, and I can't talk about all of it yet. But some of the features since like the original open sourcing used to just look for entropic strings, and so like if it looks for a lot, you know, if there's a lot of chaos, it's probably a hash or a key or something like that. Um, that's actually prone to a lot of false positives because there's a lot of reason why you might have a lot of entropy. So that's why I added um, uh, to rule detection, um, and so it went from uh, just looking for chaotic strings to looking for specific patterns for like this is an AWS key because it always starts AKIA or something like that. Right. Um, so it has both of, of those capabilities now. Um, and we just started open sourcing a bunch more this year, starting with the Chrome extension. But there's just so much more that we're going to put out um, to help people find secrets. I, I really can't wait to to start giving back a lot of those things. Would you be, uh, I know it's just kind of putting you on the spot a little bit, but would you be able to use us how to use the Chrome extension, like how you use it? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, what we can probably do is we could just go through the same example that I had uh, in the video. So let me see what we can do here. Share okay. screen. And I think with people in the chat asking for, I think we have a very, very cool um, experience to kind of see what you do. It. Let me know when you're ready for me to share your screen and I can pull it yeah, up. Yeah, you go ahead and share it. So let's see, the demo gods are uh, in our favor today. But if we just go to weather.com here, which is the exact same example that I showed, um, you know, I didn't have to go on archive.org to find it the first time. Um, found it just by going to weather.com. Um, but what's interesting is like, even after these keys get cleaned up, they're still saved in archive.org. And what I mentioned in the talk as well is there's probably a lot of keys that are buried in archive.org, but just haven't, um, been rotated. Basically this one has been rotated. Um, but let me, uh, jump into the example and hopefully this works. I'm just going to go back in time a little bit. Let's try July 11th, 2020 and see if this one, um, matches the uh the time frame where the key showed looks like it's a little slow right now we've got a pretty good internet connection so yeah so here's a um a generic key that it's found and these usually require a little bit of work to figure out if they're uh, an issue or not All oftentimes right. it's just a client tracker or something like that but um the second pop-up is for an AWS key, and those are much more interesting. Um, so when you dig into this this one a little bit, like um, it's got the prefix, the AKIA, that it matched with that pattern. Um, if we go into the source code, and this is a pretty big page, so it's just going to take a second. Take a minute, yeah. The fact that this is in the source of their main page, it's just incredible, dude. You know, it's becoming more and more popular. And one thing that I um, I kind of touched on a little bit, but not enough, is like it is so, so common for people to use these keys on internal apps. Um, like if you work at Very a company true, yeah. and they've got an internal app, like people are building all kinds of visualizers on top of S3 and stuff like that. And and they just they don't want a back end, right? It's too much friction. If you're an engineer and you just want something up and running quick, you do a short little simple React app, you put a key in there so it talks directly to S3, um, and you don't need any backend code. You could deploy the whole thing on GitHub pages if you wanted to, right? And so it's just becoming more and more popular, especially for internal apps. Um, this is a real key. Um, I think its usage um, was probably to write to a queuing system or something like that. Um, they recognized it was a problem. It had too much access. You could do bad things with it. Um, and they deactivated the key and removed it from the website. Uh, well, here's, a here's what I want to know about the tool. So right now you were browsing, you know, that website. Does it only look at the source of the current website or does it also look at the, um, like the JavaScript that it's pulling up also? Because a lot of times, you know, the codes could be buried in the JavaScript file and not, you know, we might not be as lucky as this one when it's on the. Uh, main page, but 
Um, yeah. I'm curious to see if it does that too. Glad you brought that up. It will go through the JavaScript, but it has some limitations. And I'd actually like for it to be improved in this way. I just haven't found a good way to do it. And what that way is, is basically like today, um, it'll go through the current page, then it'll find all of those JavaScript links, and then it'll refetch them. And so first your browser is going to fetch them just yeah. from rendering the page. And then the Chrome extension will go in and refetch them. So that's not great, right? You have a double load. Um, it's a little bit uh, unnecessary and it's going to have some like uh, performance issues. Right. Um, the other thing is like all the Ajax calls that the JavaScript does, right? Like the JavaScript might hit a JSON endpoint that then returns the key. Um, yeah. That's not being scanned right now by the extension. And so what I'd love to do is find some API to sit in line with all of those requests so that it can just read all the data as it flies over the wire and doesn't have to re-request the same data and also allow it to read those JSON APIs. Um, I just haven't found a great way to do it, although I think you can do it um, with service workers. Basically, okay. the way service workers work are uh, they're basically like the new version of um, like cache like if the website's not up, service workers can function as a mock backend, basically. Yeah. And one of the capabilities that they were given was the ability to look at all the inbound requests coming to it, um, do some post-processing on the outbound responses. Um, so I think it might be possible to inject service workers on the page this runs on so that I can collect those requests and responses and do some analysis there. I just haven't dug into it too deeply. Uh, there is no native API for just proxying. I look pretty hard, um, but I would love to add that capability. So if anybody um, has a bunch of free time and wants to, to send a pull request, I'll definitely accept it. <laughs> That's cool though, man. It's it's um, I know that double you know resource loading isn't the most efficient, but it's still cool that you've already thought about you know doing these, and now you're more thinking so around efficiency. You have the working concept, but now it's more of making it efficient. For sure. Um, and then one more capability I'll call out here that actually wasn't in the video. I actually forgot to include it in the video. Is like to your point about recon about DNS records. Um, I have this open lots of tabs button <laughs> <laughs> okay and what this lets you do is it just lets you paste your whole list of domains and it'll just open them all up in tabs and then it'll like run the extension on all those tabs that just open and then there's also like a download csv button somewhere in here as well i think it's under findings um yeah download all findings so if you want to automate some of this um you could run this in a headless browser or you could just run it in a headed browser as well um, and just open up like a ton of websites all at once and then just download all your findings and do some post-processing on it. You know what would be really, really cool to do with this tool, just from someone who loves uh, garbage automation, I'm talking about myself mostly, is <laughs> just being able to say tool, you know, piping tools and then piping truffle hog at the end. So, you know, I will pull a mass, feed it to HTTPX or, you know, HTTP probe, get a list of all the sites that are available, and then pipe that into my workflow of screenshots and then pipe it to truffle hog, pipe it into, you know, whatever else I want to do next. I think that would be insanely cool. Yeah. You know, it'd be a, I think a good uh, tool to help facilitate that is if either myself or somebody else threw this extension on top of puppeteer in a Docker container. Yeah. So that way this thing just runs in a headless browser. So that way you can pipe in your list of input domains and then in that Docker container, it can spin up the headless browser, it can run the whole page, it can find all the JavaScript and stuff like that. And then it just directly outputs the results. So you don't need the whole browser popping up and it's just yeah, like yeah. a command line tool or something like that. I think that's a really good idea. I should probably look into doing something like that. I feel like, like it's that. just, yeah, it's just one of those things that it's the next step of adding to your list. It's like, hey, I'm just going to pipe the output into Truffle Hog too, you know, or whatever. Like I can pipe it into this. I had this browser to do it or a tool that does a combination of both. It's just be incredibly cool to automate that because, you know, at this point, because I can just pull a list of stuff from archive.org and feed it into this too, right? I will take the whole entire archive.org at this point and pipe into Truffle Hog if I could. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to um, have a good talk. <laughs> I'd love to work with them on that. Yeah. If they give, if they give us raw access to the data, um, like, there's an obscene amount of data they collect and I'm sure it's got yeah. thousands of keys or something. Um, and they probably don't want that. I imagine archive.org doesn't want to hold on to everybody's keys like that. So 
uh, if anybody knows anybody over there, I'd love to, to partner with them on that and, and to get that stuff cleaned up because I'm sure it's just a treasure trove of keys. I think we should sit down at some point. I know we should probably talk about this live right now, but I think we should <laughs> sit down one day and create some POCs for them and just literally go after people that work for it and say, hey, you know, you guys aren't doing anything. Are you? No one thought about this thing. But we found, you know, 10 keys in the last 10 hours, and this is a POC for it now. Will you give us raw access? And implementing something cool for archive.org that catches these before it catches them and puts them out on the internet in that layer in the, in the middle would be incredibly dope, I feel like. Yeah, for sure. Do you remember uh, Cloudbleed? Yep. Yeah, that was that same problem where uh, uh, Cloudflare was just accidentally putting random chunks of data in random websites where it didn't belong. And some of that data was keys. And then uh, archive.org oh, yeah. slurped it up. And then those keys were immortalized on archive.org. So even after you know Cloudflare fixed their stuff, uh, a lot of those keys ended up in the archive. Jesus. Oh, my God. Another fun one that I, I laugh about all the time is like um, GitHub. Um, you know, for all the secrets that that are on GitHub, right? That now they've got some like internal team like spun up on trying to clean up the secrets and stuff like that, and um, a lot of security researchers are finding them. Um, but they've got that Arctic Archive. You know what I'm talking about? Like they oh. announced a while ago that they took a snapshot of all of the code back in 2018 or something like that, and they put it on these long-lived storage devices, and then they buried it in the Arctic tundra for future archaeologists to find the old code. Well, the keys are in there. And so, and so it's like, like this record that's preserved that'll be uncovered 10,000 years from now. They're going to find the ancient AWS keys that probably still haven't been rotated. <laughs> like, it probably wouldn't be rotated by then either. That's a, that's a sad part of it is that you're absolutely right, man. It's probably not rotated by then at all. It's still the same code. Right. It's funny. Google Cloud actually has like a, um like the keys will will not work more than 10 years i think i don't know why they added that because it's definitely gonna you know hurt somebody in 10 years but for them it doesn't matter but i think aws doesn't have anything like that so those those ten thousand year old keys will probably still be juicy and gcp's gotta get a ton of pissed off emails in like a few years <laughs> from customers that didn't know it expires yeah don't quote me on that but i just i heard that at some point that there are only 10 years that's incredible. Uh, that's awesome, though, man. I've uh, I've used Truffle a few times, but I've never used the extension. I think I'm just gonna. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna install all my browsers, <laughs> just to see if at one point it's gonna pop up and say, "Hey, Truffle Hog just found uh, a key here," just to see if it happens on accident. Those are I think the most uh, the the most like fun stories to tell. Like, yeah, I wasn't even hacking, and I was browsing this website, and then keys pop up. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It'll it'll probably pop up too much. So what you need to do is if you're using it like that, turn off the generic secrets and just leave on like AWS keys or some of the specific secrets or something like that. So it'll just be focused on the juicy stuff. Yeah. And yeah, it'll happen probably like every two weeks or something like that. You'll just be browsing, you know, trying to buy a, a book or something on some third party website and there's an AWS key. <sighs> And the F in the chat, that's not going to at all. Um, I have a few questions about developing tools. Um, when you develop, when you're developing, do you stick working on one tool or do you work on multiple projects at the same time? Oh, I, I got too many stuff going on. Like I've got uh, many, many projects um, that I'm working <clears throat> on in parallel, some of which don't see the light of day, unfortunately, just because, you know, th th there's other stuff that comes up and takes priority. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I usually juggle like many projects at the same time. And um, has there ever been a idea that you wanted to turn into a tool, but it just didn't work out? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, you'll you'll have a hunch about something, um, and and then you'll try it, and sometimes like your hunch will just be wrong, and then uh, you know it's, it's important to not have some cost fallacy and just you know, get back on that horse and, and start something new. Yeah, I think most people do have these ambitious ideas to writing a tool, but when you sit down to figure out the logistics of it, it's a lot harder than what you expected. Uh, but I would love to hear from some of, you know, when the hackers like tools that they have tried to do because, you know, they thought it would work out and it didn't. It would be cool to hear some of these ideas. Yeah, I think a lot of times, um, that'll happen when you experience some kind of rate limiting. And so you might be like, oh, I'm going to do this thing. Like I'm going to scan like all of uh, 
all of GitHub or something like that. And then you start to get into the logistics of it and you're like, oh, well, they only give you a thousand queries per right. hour. Um, so, you know, you're, you're limited. Um, so I'd say like that's happened before where I'm like, I'm going to build this thing that's going to be like super ambitious and it's going to scan or archive all this stuff. Certificate transparency is actually another good one. Like um, there's actually more fields that are interesting on the certificate than just location. And not all of those are indexed in CRT.sh. Yeah. CRT.sh aggressively rate limits you. Like you can only do like one query a minute or something like that. It's, it's pretty rough. So I was like, cool, I'll just download all the certificates myself. <laughs> no, I'll do it myself. Yeah. Or anything, right? <laughs> so you read through the certificate transparency spec and you're like, okay, it's just these JSON APIs. And then you find some tools out there like Axman and you hack some stuff together, you run it on a server. And very soon you realize like it's going to take six months to pull yeah. all these things down. Um, and, and some of the certificate transparency servers will rate limit you as well. Um, so that kind of stuff happens a lot where you, you get started on something and you just realize just it's not really technically feasible unless you um, have a tremendous amount of time or have some sort of work around the rate limiting. Um, when it comes down to creating new tools, how do you choose a new tool to build when there are already similar tools or there's similar research has been, you know, in progress already? Yeah, I mean, that's always going to bite you. Um, it's like, you you know, you open source something. Um, you do a little bit of diligence ahead of time to see if the thing already exists and it doesn't, and then you open source it. And then somebody harangues you because there's some talk back in, you know, 2007 where they briefly called out something similar and you're like, all right, I apologize that I didn't know about this and didn't give it credit and stuff. An example of that was back in 2014 or something like that. I open sourced um, proof of concept for cracking half of a four-way WPA2 handshake. I called it the WPA2 half handshake crack. Yeah. Um, basically like up until then the common knowledge was, okay, you got a client, you got a server or you have a client, you have a router, you capture that full handshake and then you can crack that handshake. Um, but what I realized was you could actually set up a fake router and the client would start the handshake and you could never complete it because you don't have the pre-shared key on your end of it, but yeah. you have enough of that half handshake where you could start cracking that password from the client and you can still figure out what the password is, and then you can stand up the router with that password and get that client to connect to you. So I put that out, called it WPA2 Half Handshake, thought it was original, did a bunch of work uh, researching, trying to find other people that mentioned it, didn't find anything. Um, it, it got um, kind of popular, and then at some point, somebody called it out. They were like, this university talk from you know 2006, this professor at timestamp 3601 <laughs> briefly I called out that. that you know you could you could do this. And I'm like, uh, all right, I apologize. I give this guy credit. Like he clearly knew about it before I did. Um, this was, you know, as far as I know, I was the first person to put out the tool for it. But yeah, that guy <laughs> way before my time. Um, you know, called it out in that university one time. And so, you know, you just, you have to be aware that that's going to happen. And even, you know, even when that happens, um, like it's, it's okay. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of just expected. I mean, the thing is like, I think with today's day and age, man, like a lot of ideas have already came up. Like it's, it's going to be a lot harder to come up with something unique. I'm not saying it's impossible. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm just saying, People have hinted to things. Wouldn't it be nice to do this? Just like what we're talking about, piping truffle hog. We just talked about it. it. Doesn't mean that it's going to happen. And then in three years from now, maybe someone's going to do that, right? Doesn't mean that you didn't credit them, but it's just these ideas happen. Um, yeah. yeah. I think, um, another good example is just around like creating, you know, good digital content to present the information in a way that's maybe more consumable than the first time it was presented. And I think maybe the, uh, um, you know, the the keynote speaker that that y'all had at Hacktivity Conference, um, Vicky you. Lee is a great example of that. Where on her blog, she put out tons of stuff that was already known, but she just put it in a way that was more consumable and easier to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's nothing wrong with that. So you know, e even though somebody else has maybe done it or presented on it even, that doesn't mean that you can't still bring value and and like show it to new people and present it in yeah. a slightly different way. I agree. It's uh, I. The thing is like, we, we live on the internet, right? Uh, people behind a keyboard are gonna call everything out. It's just a part of the internet culture. But I still think, you know, 
I, I encourage people to recreate tools. You know, do it. You don't have to, you know, say it's the best tool or better tool, but it's just the process of creating tools, doing research, gives you an entirely different perspective on doing these kinds of research and hacking and that kind of thing. It gives you a lot of experience trying to make a tool. Um, you become better at that subject, I feel like, because now you have to implement whatever's in your brain, whatever you've been doing for, you know, three months, four months into code <clears throat> that people with no background could also use. You have to make it accessible, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. But um, when you come down to like writing tools, how do you get an idea for a new tool? Like, how do you decide, okay, I need to implement this into a new tool? I want to open source this, so I want to create this. So, how does that process work for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably have a pretty nerdy answer to that. But when a <laughs> when a new technology hits the space, uh, like right. the browser unleashes this new uh, capability, like a service worker or something like that. Uh, if, if you're the first on the scene and you read that browser specification and you learn how that technology works, um, you're going to figure out that there's some security angle that they hadn't considered. And you're going to yeah. realize that, um, you know, that, that that same technology that they're building for, the, for this certain capability, right? In the case of service workers, they built it for, for the, the use case where the backend server isn't accessible. And so they want this service worker to function as a fake backend server. Um, one of the capabilities they gave it was to give it some time to process your data even after you close the tab. Because if yeah. you think about a backend server, it's it, you know if they're doing image processor or something like that, that could take some time. So they're like, okay, we're going to let the service worker run for you know an extra five minutes after the tab's been closed. Well, just think about the from a security perspective where you click a malicious link and maybe that malicious link is trying to spray your internal network with um, you know, CSRF payloads or DNS rebinding or something like that. Um, but you've got a service worker that can continue to run for five minutes after the tab's closed. I mean, <laughs> like click a malicious link, close the tab, and now you still have malware running for another five minutes yeah. hammering your internal <laughs> network. And so that's that's kind of my answer is like if you stay on top of the technology, the security stuff and the tooling will fall out of it. Um, and so if you're, if you're reading those specs, if you're paying attention to the new features that are coming out, um, and you're just kind of wearing that from the hat of, okay, they built it for that reason, but what's the bad thing you could do with it? Um, like you, you just naturally will, will see that and figure out what tool needs to be built to, to show that. Yeah. I mean, um. I, I'm I've I'm not really good, you know, with creating tools. I've always wondered what is the what is it that gets you to finally say, okay, I'm automating this, making it into a tool. Um, and I think it's a good, you know, it's a good place to know. Like, it's based on technology. If it's a new technology and being the first to put something out for it, it's probably going to be a good approach for um, that topic. Um, let's talk about a little bit outside of hacking. Um, we've talked about open sourcing a little bit, and I know you are. I'm really big on open sourcing um, tools and um, kind of want to hear your thoughts on why is it important? Why is the open source community so important to you and um, why are you such a big advocate for it? Yes. I mean, like we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, like our entire technology stack, um, all the way up and down, all the OSI models, um, like every single piece of that is built on decades of people that have been writing code before us. Um, and, and really the ones that stick around are the open source pieces, the standards that are open, um, the pieces that are transparent, that have been audited for a long time. Um, the most popular operating system on the planet in our lifetimes became Linux, an open source operating system. Um, and there's a reason why that one was the most popular one. Same thing with databases. Um, Back in the day, it used to be like IBM and Oracle, closed source proprietary databases were the way, right? IBM mainframe you see from all the um, 80s movies. But but these days, you wouldn't think about using a database unless it was open source, right? Your Postgres, your yeah. MySQL, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, it really is taking over the world. Um, and there's so many benefits to open sourcing code that you're working on. Um, so, you know, really, I think, whether you want it to or not, like all, all of the future, I think, is open source. But from the perspective of like you're working on a tool, should you open source it or not, there, there is so much more that you're not seeing and that you're never going to see unless you share what you're working on. There's so much more perspective. There's so much, you know, 
more usage of that tool from an angle that you hadn't thought about it before. And if you're building it for yourself, you're probably building it with the experiences that you've had and the background that you've had going into that tool. But the minute you open it, you're globally giving access to this thing and allowing so many different people and so many different use cases. And um, you're giving them that same access and you're allowing them to contribute to the tool. I guarantee you, you're going to see value add on top of what you thought was the limits of the capabilities of this thing. You're going to find somebody brought something else and some new perspective to the table. Um, the other thing is, is just around, I think, like equity and civic good. Um, like we talked about uh, cost barrier to entry for, for yeah. certain bug bounties and stuff like that. Um, open source is the way that we give equity for civic hacking. Um, you know, a burp license costs, I don't know how much, um, but 500. She's, I mean, for, for certain, I have to people, renew mine right now. That's why I know it, <laughs> you know, for, for, so for certain people, that's just inaccessible, right? Uh -huh. Like they're, so they're just not going to be able to pay $500 to, to hack like that. And, um, you know, equipping people with those free and open tools, um, it, it's a way to bring equity and kind of let everyone come to the same playing field so that we're all, um, you know, we're all able to chase the same bug bounties and we all have the same um, starting point, basically. Yeah. And then you mentioned something about, you know, deciding whether or not you want to open source a tool. What is your feedback on people that are, that have this great tool? I mean, let me take a step back, actually. You know, with the with open sourcing tools, it's, it's a curse and a blessing, right? And I think you know where I'm going with this. The blessing here is that you're open sourcing it. Everyone gets to use it. You're kind of creating this... Um, even playing field, right? Everyone has access to the same tools, uh, which is good and bad because, you know, some people are script kiddies. They don't know how to do the work. They just use a tool. Unfortunately, it's a reality of it. But there's also the negative aspect of opening tools, right? Open sourcing tools. What if it ends up on the uh, hands of the wrong people? Um, even besides the hands of the, you know, the wrong people, it's, you know, this is my research. I want to use it more and more and more before I put it out. How do you decide? When do you decide it's a good time to open source your tool? What is your, you know, what is your feedback or your recommendation? Because you know, with Truffle Hog, it's a huge thing what you have put out. It's a, it's a very good. Um, it's cleaning up a lot of good stuff, right? With whether it's bug bounties, people doing them internally for themselves, whatever that is. It's, but where did you decide? You know, okay, I've had my fun with this tool. You know, you probably had that ethic conversation of what if it ends up in someone's hand and then you decide to uh, open source it. What did that process look like? Yeah. So I think, you know, the, there's maybe two parts to that question. The, the, the first part of like what happens if it ends up in, in the wrong hands. Um, you know, I, I think the, 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 the hacker community in, in the traditional sense of the word, the, ha the hacker with the black hat, um, they are building war scripts and an industry off of proprietary closed tools that we'll never see, um, you know, the, the other side of like, yeah. especially like ransomware as a service and stuff like that. It's becoming more and more popular and commoditized, mm -hmm. um, where, where the other side will just build all these capabilities out to, to hack people yeah. and that'll never get open. And so when you're deciding whether or not you should open something on the, on the, on the white hat side, there is a huge amount of asymmetry of what the capabilities are on the side of, of evil yeah. <laughs> versus, you know, the, the small minority amount of people that have decided to open source their, their stuff on the, on the white hat side. And so, you know, in, in terms of, of that, like, could this tool fall into the wrong hands? The, the wrong hands already have their, their hands on some really Absolutely. scary capabilities. And so I'm, I'm not super concerned with that side of things. It, it is wild to watch, you know, I open source Truffle Hog and then the DJI drone hacking community comes in and then uses that to unlock the drones and then, you know, causes the Chinese government to put the developer in jail who leaked the key and stuff like that. Like I, I hear you hundred percent. Like yeah. that's, that's the other side of that is like feeling how that weighs on your conscious. Um, but actually, hold on. That shouldn't be on you though. You didn't make the mistake of putting those keys in there. It's unfortunate that they used your tool, but your tool wasn't what would have found that solely, right? That, those cases could have been found with another tool, with another method. It's just your tool made it easier. 
I think you're right that those those keys would have been identified eventually. Someone would yeah. have written a tool, whether that be on the black hat side or, or the white hat side. Uh, but it, it still weighs on you, right? You still yeah. put that tool out and then they did use that tool. Um, that's still, you know, that's still like is something that that you think about. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to, to, to the other side of, of your of your question about like, well, what if I could just make a whole bunch of money by by hoarding this this tool or whatever? I guarantee you there's going to be so much more positive outcome for you and your personal brand and your career and things like that from open sourcing the tool than there would be from you just making a little bit of extra bug bounty money on the side. Like you'll have the ability to speak at conferences. You'll have the ability to, to grow this community around the tool. Um, I would definitely bias on the side of, of open sourcing it. Um, I think yeah. it's common that hackers will hang on to it for a little bit for maybe like a month or two. So they get, you know, the kind of their, their first take on it. Um, but, but after that, um, you know, I, I really think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not only like you're, you're always going to have a little bit of an advantage just because you're going to understand the tool better than everybody else. And you're going to be yeah. able to use it, um, a little bit more effectively than other people will. Um, but there's just so many more positive benefits that'll come from open sourcing it than there are from, from withholding it. I agree. It's um, someone in the chat also said this. Like, it's been a conversation in in infosec or anywhere. Ethics is a big part of it, right? But at the same time, I want to go back to what I was saying with the you know the. I, I know that it weighs on you because you you know you start thinking like, oh, maybe you know I did this or my tool made it more accessible, whatever, right? But at the end of the day, you didn't put the keys there. Uh, it, it was going to happen. It was bound to happen. It would have been discovered maybe later, and then th that would have been a worse incident, right? Uh, if it wasn't for finding it early on and that kind of stuff. But yeah, there's a there's a good effect to, to go back to what you were saying. There's a good the good positive outcome of things that could happen because of your tool. It could be important in people, you know, in companies' uh, cycles of how they do things or their internal processes and that kind of stuff. But it's just always a question of like, when do you know enough is enough? When do you know to, you know, it's the right time to um, push this code out and open source it? Yeah, no, that's, that's a hundred percent right. And, and I think, you know, for, for all of the, there is this occasional story of, of something that happened really bad. There's so many more stories of people ethically finding keys and cleaning them up as the result of this tool. Yeah. Um, and, and I think if you kind of flipped the script and you were like, well, what if you didn't open source it? And then some black hat hacker instead wrote a proprietary script that did the same thing. Yeah. And then they go up and, you know, grab all of those keys that you wouldn't otherwise have, a, you know, an army of ethical hackers going and cleaning up. Um, that's, that's kind of the other side of that coin. But I, I do think there are certain lines, like there are certain tools, there are certain things that, that I wouldn't make and I wouldn't open source. Like maybe ransomware is a good example. Yeah. I, I don't I think, you know, that's, that's really a, um, you know, to open source a comprehensive ransomware framework and, and call it an educational tool or something like that. Like it's probably going to do more harm than good if I had to guess. Right. Like, yeah, that's, it's a very valid point. It, it comes down to what your tool can ultimately do. Um, and how like accessible the tool is, you know, if you're setting up a tool that takes a little bit more setup, some background knowledge, things you need to know before you go into it, then probably not going to end up in a lot of bad hands. Cause you know, as you mentioned, the people with uh, what I call the cyber criminals are already ahead of it. They probably have a tool similar to it. They probably bought it somewhere. It's already service for it. Who knows? But also it's how accessible you make the tool, how easy to use you make it. Uh, that could do a lot of uh, damage. Yeah, um, for sure. Or just, you know, ask yourself is, you know, can this tool be used for good? And I think no. there are tools out there that just can't like, they're just mono focused on, on doing bad basically. I mean, if you think about it, like SQL map is a very good example of it, right? SQL map, I think could, could definitely be used ethically for bug bounties for reporting Absolutely. Things, stuff like that. Um, but I mean, the wrong person that doesn't know shit about hacking runs that tool on the right endpoint and the wrong parameter, dumps a database. Like, you yeah, know. I mean, I think maybe a step further might be something like Metasploit or Empire, where those are malware frameworks used to hack into places and you can't really use them for bug bountying. Um, but they are used for ethical hackers, like um, usually a, a red team or like a, um, a consulting firm or something like that will use them. Um, but that's definitely further along on the spectrum of like those those are definitely uh, tools that are also being used for for weapons of war basically 
Yeah, um, not to again change the topic, but I also want to get to on a personal level, and there's a really good question that came in. Um, before I get to that, I, I usually end the stream with uh, asking about mental health, but we'll, I, want, I want to get to that in just a bit. Um, when you got into InfoSec and you started getting into bug bounty and research, um, speaking at you know conferences like DEF CON and Black Hat, did you have anybody that mentored you directly or indirectly? Directly being a direct mentor you reached out to, this, you know, the objective was to learn from them, improve whatever you were doing. Indirectly would be people that you admired in the industry you looked up to that had an effect on you because of did X, Y, and Z. Um, did you have anybody like that? Yeah, I mean, I always have mentors or I try to for for whatever it is I'm trying to do. And that's, that's even true to this day. Um, so now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build a company around open source security tools. Um, and I have a bunch of awesome mentors to help me do that. Um, security founders that have sort of grown companies themselves before, like the founder yeah. of Signal Science, Zane Lackey, or the founder of Material Security, Ryan Noon. Those folks have been tremendously helpful to me. Um, but I'd say in general, you know, as long as you're humble and very good at receiving feedback, you should always seek out people that have done the thing that you're trying to do yeah. uh, and ask them for help. And more often than not, um, you know, you'd be surprised how many, how many times if you just shoot a LinkedIn message or something like that, um, they'll get back to you and be happy to jump on a call with you and help you through it. Do you think mentorship is a, is a big role in just growth for anybody with, especially with InfoSec? Oh, for sure. Uh, InfoSec or otherwise, just whatever you're trying to do. Um, you know, I, I think reading about it is is one thing. And like, that's not to say anything against like that, that style of learning or anything like that. But I just think, um, you know, get it, getting the chance to talk directly with people and to, to ask them questions and to be humble and receiving feedback as well, like uh, positive or negative feedback from those mentors. Um, that's, that's a super valuable skill that's, that's going to help you grow in, in many dimensions, you know, beyond just InfoSec. Yeah. Um, what about collaboration? Do you collaborate with a lot of hackers or do you think collaboration also helps, you know, with learning and getting better at uh, hacking? I try to. Um, I actually haven't done a whole lot of talks solo, like this Hacktivity Con conference. It's maybe the exception of the rule, but both times I spoke at DEF CON, um, it was with somebody else. Um, yeah. When I spoke at Black Hat, that was with somebody else. When I spoke at KiwiCon, that was with somebody else. Um, it, it just it kind of it motivates me a little more and um, brings a, a certain social aspect. And you both kind of lift each other up. Absolutely. Um, bring a slightly different perspective as well. Um, so I, I usually do when I'm working on something, I, I'd like to find somebody who could be tangentially interested, just try to pull them in basically. I, the, the, the thing you said about like elevating both people, it's incredible, man. A lot of people don't understand how valuable it is to just work alongside somebody else just because, not just for you, for both of you, the pers perspective it should be a big thing in life, whether it's for hacking, whether it's for learning something, the perspective and seeing it from the other person's point of view, how they approach the same uh, problem, the same topic, the same research as you, how they approach it is incredible because you just go, oh shit, I never thought of doing that this way or, oh, I never you know, thought this would work or this is an idea or whatever that was. Uh, so I always recommend find someone who's either in the same skill sets as you, in the same range, maybe a little bit better, a little bit worse, not even worse, but a little bit better, More know, knows more about stuff you don't know, and vice versa, and kind of collaborate with them and learn from each other. Uh, that's a big thing. I, I think 100%. going back to the stay the humble thing, I think staying humble and putting your ego aside and shifting it aside to say, I don't know these things and I want to learn from this person. And, you know, my whole thing is, I don't know if I can teach him anything, you know, from my perspective, maybe, but I, you know, I'm sure that I can learn a couple of things from them just working with them a few times. Um, and that was probably one of the best things I did in my entire career. 100%. Yeah. And I'll even take what you said a step further. Like, you know, you said, look for somebody around the same level as you. Um, I don't think it hurts to shoot higher, you know, right. to find somebody who's really good in this space and to just be humble, be open and be like, hey, um, you know, do you have something you're working on that we might be able to collaborate on? Or can you give me some advice? I'm I'm just starting to learn this thing. Can you can you explain how this works? And um, you know, if they say no, that's it. Uh, not a big right. deal. But um, more often than not, I've found people people like mentoring folks that are humble and open and good at receiving feedback and all that kind of stuff. It's just uh, it's just hard to do at that level because then I feel like it becomes more um, more around 
a mentorship than collaboration. That's true. You know, like it's not, yeah, it just comes down to that. But also like, it's just hard at that level too, because like a lot of people want to learn. This, again, this is my personal experience is that a lot of people want to do these X, Y, and Z things, but the questions that you always get into DM doesn't explain like, hey, I have I want to learn X, I've done Y, Z, this is the things I've tried. And this is the point I want to get to in this time. You know, like there is no real conversation that it's just mostly, can you teach me how to do X? It's just, you have to say, hey, I want to learn X by doing these things. These are the things I've tried. Where do I go next level? When I see a message like that, I do 10 out of 10 times, I reply. Yeah. But also 9 out of 10 times, that's not the message I get, unfortunately. And I'm not saying I'm high up on my game, but it's just people that are very new to hacking or park might not want to do that. Then it becomes mentorship and you're not really giving me a lot of information to know how to help you. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Um, let's talk about... Uh, my favorite topic, mental, uh, mental health. Uh, there's a question that came in. I'll start off with that. If I can find it here. Uh, security be asked, um, where is it? Are you faced with imposter syndrome when releasing a tool? When releasing a tool? Um, well, I mean, I think everybody faces imposter syndrome at some point in their career. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I don't know that I've ever faced it at that particular time, but I've definitely faced it, you know, when starting a new job or something like that, or like, you, you know, you might hold a certain, um, a certain type of job at a, on a, on a pedestal or have it in your mind as like this, this big paradigm of like, you know, if I ever go to work there, that's, that's paradise. Yeah. And then, you know, your first day there for sure. Like I think most people in that experience will have imposter syndrome. Um, but I mean, I think it's also, important to recognize the other side of it, which is just, I do fit a certain mold of person. Like I do have that college degree that's computer related. Um, I, I do have a certain experience that is homogenous um, with a lot of other hackers out there. And there are some people that have more unique backgrounds and different diverse experiences. And, and those people are, are, you know, it only makes them stronger hackers. But I think definitely with that comes a certain level of imposter syndrome because they come to the table and everybody looks a different way. Right. Um, it could be more difficult for them to kind of break in and start the conversation from that from that starting point. How do you deal with imposter syndrome when you when it, you know, see it creeping up or when you deal with it? Um, I mean, that's, that's a good question. I think like recognizing diversity and inclusion is definitely an important thing. Like I've done that yeah. before. Like I've, I've, uh, uh, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to speak to, to certain leaders of, um, uh, of, of bug bounty platforms. I won't call out which one by name, but I've, I've just said, Hey, look, you know, the way you're organizing these events and the type of community that you're growing is, is you know, it, it could be made more inclusive, basically, yeah. there, there are areas for improvement. Um, and if you don't, then the wall garden is just going to grow higher and higher. And it's going to be harder and harder for those people to enter in, and they're going to feel that imposter syndrome and just turn right. away. Um, so I think, you know, especially when you're growing community, it's really important super early on to build it in a way that's diversity and inclusive friendly. Otherwise, um, that imposter syndrome is going to be there, and it's just going to get worse over time. Yeah, imposter syndrome is one of those um, one of those things that's never going to go away. Um, it just comes down to, I, I still think it's an ego thing. I hate that I bring up ego a lot, but I feel like it's also an ego thing of not wanting to admit that you don't know things. You, you just, you're not an imposter. You just don't know everything. None of us know everything. Um, I know a mentor said something just recently that said, uh, none of us can know everything in this quickly changing world. Uh, we call infosec and it and it goes beyond infosec it goes beyond technology it's just when you come to terms that you tell yourself i don't know everything i'm just good at these things and i'm willing to learn it i'm willing to put my ego aside and say i don't know this thing and this person's better than not even better than know more than i do and i'm going to go learn from them or direct indirectly learn from them or make it a goal to want to learn these things and i think just egos are you just got to kill your ego sometimes and then once you kill your ego and positive syndrome it's a lot easier to deal with yeah, and I think maybe the other side of that coin is like when you have somebody in a position of power um, and you see someone with a lot of ego that's making it difficult for somebody else to join, super, yeah. super important to call that out. And I'll give a shout out to to yourself and HackerOne for having those rigid community standards and enforcing them. Um, it's really important when you have that 
position of of uh, moder moderatorship and um, you know, you know that that position of power to uh, sort of walk the walk and make sure that you know you grow that community in a way that um, allows for folks to not feel like there's a ton of ego that are pushing them out of the space. Yeah. Um, Cause I think you're absolutely right. That ego is kind of what, what fosters that imposter syndrome a lot of times. Yeah. And uh, with, you know, when you said the diversity and inclusion thing, um, I think with just having more a diverse community, it just makes things easier. You have more perspective. I, I love the fact I've said perspective so many times, but it's just, you bring in a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different, knowledge and all different experiences and put them all together then you know the same people that think the same and look at things the same way um i think uh yeah ego and the diversity thing is very important because when you have a lot of different backgrounds of people in the same room you realize you're not an imposter everybody's dealing with this everybody has the same thing it's just how you handle it i dealt with imposter syndrome a lot man like a lot of times yeah um this is like early on before i was been making content it came to a point when i was just like dude i don't know anything I, I sometimes forget the most basic concepts but then i realized no everybody googles this shit like it's not just me we're going to google and <laughs> google the most right. concept you know it's just a part of life it's a part of uh because your brain could hold so much so many things and if you're not using them every day it's not being practiced every day. You're going to forget it. But I struggled with it a lot. I just didn't think I belonged for a while. And then I was just like, no, no, I had to remind myself I've done these things. I've done these specific life achievements of mine that I wanted to do. It's just now it's the next level of just admitting it to myself, accepting it that I'm not an imposter. I just need to know more and work on learning more and more. 100%. Definitely. Which brings up another, you know, topic of just uh, burning out too, right? Because, you know, you, you get to the whole like, oh, I want to learn these things. I have these ambitious goals. I want to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and then you start burning out. How, do you deal with a lot of burnouts? I mean, that's a good question. I have maybe a hot take on burnout. Uh, hopefully not too too controversial. But I think, um, you know, a lot of people associate burnout with, um, with working like too long. Uh, too many hours, not having yeah. a, a good work-life balance and stuff like that. Um, for, for me, um, like personally, I've worked in environments where people are working 80 hours a week plus and still incredibly passionate about what they're doing and driven. Um, but that's because those environments are very mission-driven and have certain deliverables that, um, you know, that, that make you feel good about the work that you're doing. It, I think, you know, the other side of that, I've worked in environments where people are only working 35 hours a week and they're coming in late every day and, and not working on Fridays and things like that. But they, they say that they're burned out. And I think the reason is because in those environments, um, there isn't really much to feel good about in terms of your job. There isn't very uh, much mission, um, commonality of things that you're working towards. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of you know, dry, monotonous, and then, you know, what are you doing it for? There's, there's not really much improvement that's happening. Um, so for me, burnout is basically like, whatever it is that you're doing, um, you have to feel like there's a, you know, a, a reason for doing it. And you have to feel like that, that thing is important to you, whatever that reason might be. Um, otherwise, you're going to get burned out regardless of how many hours you put into it. Um, you know, if, if you're doing something just for the money or something like that, um, or you're doing something where like, you know, you're working in house at a security team and no matter how much effort you're putting in your the security posture is just never getting any better. And like, you know, nobody is, is acknowledging these bugs or anything like that. And it's just the same churn week over week, you're going to get burned out kind of regardless of, of what that effort is that you put in. So I, I don't really associate it much with necessarily um, work-life balance or amount of hours that you put in, or like you have to take a certain amount of vacation. Um, for me, burnout is more just, you have to love what you do. Otherwise yeah. you're going to get burned out. And I think that's especially hard maybe in, um, in pandemic time where it's it's just harder to connect with the work that you do, especially when all it's right. all through a screen and you're not even leaving the room that you're in. Um, and so I think a lot of people are getting burned out now because of that. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it's because people are working too many hours or people aren't taking enough vacation. I think it's more just people aren't really feeling the impact of, of the work that they're doing and they're not feeling that mission, not feeling that drive, and they're not feeling the benefits of, of the work that they're putting into. 
I definitely agree to some extent of what you said with, uh, you know, the burnout thing, like the passion and the drive makes a huge difference. There's times when I have to do a project, but I don't like to do it. I work 30 hours and I'm burnt out and I don't, I don't want to do it. I don't want to get this thing done. I don't see the point, but I have to kind of do it. There's times that I like activity conference, organizing conferences. Dude, there's tremendous amounts of hours that go in there. And by the time I get done with it, I'm not burnt out. I'm just exhausted. It's a different thing than being burnt out. It's not that I don't want to do it again. I'm ready to do another conference. I'm going to another conference to speak at just already, but it's just, I'm exhausted. But the burning out thing, you're absolutely right. It's more of a passion thing. So I used to, I'm going to give you a personal example of exactly what you said. It was that I would work this many hours a week because I, you know, nine to five, I have my nine to five hustle, then I have my side hustle of content, hacking, pen testing, whatever X, Y, Z that I do on the side. And then I realized, okay, I'm going to work like eight weeks. And then I put a number on it. I'm going to work eight weeks, one week off, eight weeks, one week off. And then it came to a point where I realized like after I work for eight weeks on the sixth or seven week is when I perform the best, right? I hit that peak. I'm running through it. By the time I'm at the peak, it's time for a break when you put a number attached to it, right? And I realized like, no, I'm not going to put a number next to it. I'm just going to set up goals. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to finish it. I'm going to hit that goal. You know, I'm going to finish this project at work. I'm going to do this thing for personal reasons, or I'm going to put out this video course, whatever. And then I'm going to go on a break. Because when you put those numbers of like, the, the term work-life balance is a scam. If you're just thinking in terms of balance of like, I have 24 hours a day, eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work, eight hours. No, that's not how it works. Work-life balance is I'm going to go hard for three months. I'm going to take a week off. You know, I'm going to spend a day. You know, my Saturdays are, I used to stream. I haven't streamed on a Saturday in so long because I realized that's my work-life balance. I need that one day off to myself because unlike most people, I work nine to five and I work six to 10. I need one day to rest my brain and not do anything, right? But when you put a number to it, like you said, like, oh, you work this many hours and you take, you know, vacation days. No, that doesn't, that's not how it works. You just got to wait to see, I hit this goal. I just got to disconnect for a little bit. And then I disconnect and I try not to take my laptop or iPad or anything with me. Three days is all I need. Disappear by the water, go on a beach, go somewhere that's, you know, outside of my, this office that I spend, you know, about 60, 80 hours a week. And uh, I, yeah, you know, reward yourself. It's uh, mentors is saying it. I reward myself with a vacation, or you know, go somewhere, get a hotel, a staycation somewhere, and do that. Yeah, hundred percent. I I absolutely agree with you on on goal setting. Right, you need that feeling of accomplishment. You need to be able to, um, you know, to be to feel proud of the thing that you did. Right. Um, and there's definitely jobs where that's that's tricky to do. Like I think maybe an example of that could be. Um, Maybe, maybe even like uh, bug bounty triage, where just every day, you know, you're going through the same churn of triaging Absolutely, these bugs. Right. Um, you know, yeah. what are the goals that you're working towards? And, and what, you know, what are the things that you get to look back on and say, these are the things that I feel proud of that I've accomplished? It could be such a churn um, to, to do that sort of triage work. And folks that are doing bug bounty should definitely have a ton of empathy and respect for the triagers on the other side, since it's it's one in particular that I think it's difficult to kind of set goals for, and it's very easy to get burned out on. Yeah, triage, man. I, I did triage for a while. Please don't come after me. I don't do it anymore. Please don't tell me about your reports. But I did it for a year, year and a half, and you're just sitting on a screen reading things. And sometimes you have to make sense of it. You have to understand you, the, the person writing it doesn't fluently speak English. And then on top of that, it's just a complex bugs of like 30 steps of loading this, loading that, clicking on this. And you just like, you're, by the time you finish, you're like, I just don't want to do this anymore. And you have to do that for like at least 40 hours a day, uh, 40 hours a week. <laughs> and you also have to hit, you know, the SLAs that the people require, require or the, the, the hackers want their stuff to be triaged quickly. And then there's a pressure of like, you didn't read my book, but empathy, man. Like the biggest thing that I think helped me have empathy for a lot of the folks that run bug bounty program. It doesn't have to be a triage on a platform, but just running a bug bounty program was running my own bug bounty program for six months. And I was just like, holy crap, no wonder some of these bugs take forever to get fixed. You don't even own, you don't even know who owns this product at some point, right? I'm sure you've dealt with that internet, a company you work for. Like you get this thing and you go, well, this person left six months ago. This environment's still up. No one owns it anymore. Uh, how do we fix it, guys? <laughs> right? But people don't see that ever. It's just they expect oh, you're a multi billion dollar company. Why aren't you doing this? It just doesn't work that way. There's so many people you have to talk to. There's so many hoops you have to jump through. And learning that was 
definitely a stop across my face of realizing, okay, you need to be a little bit more patient with people. The bigger the org, it's probably more difficult. Definitely. Yeah, I have maybe a, a feature request since you were talking about it. It got me thinking, um, here's a feature request for Hacker One: is when you get a bounty um, and it's, you know, however big it is, uh, an option to tip your triager to say, I want to take a small yeah. piece of that bounty and give it to that triager at this experience. That'd be very great. cool. I think a lot of people have requested, that'd be very incredibly cool to be able to do that to the triagers. Um, I mean, it's like a collaboration thing too. They can add as a collaborator and give it to them. Cause we have that collaboration future. We can add someone and split the bounty with them. Oh, gotcha. But there isn't a tip thing, which would be even better. Like, Hey, would you like to donate to this triager? Uh, but I feel like there's gonna be a lot of memes and opinions that are gonna come out of that. <laughs> uh, one last thing I want to ask you, man. Um, you mentioned you were doing bug bounties, you've worked full time, you develop tools, you, you're creating content now on YouTube. Um, how do you manage your time? Yeah, I mean, do you have a routine? That's a good question. Disorganized chaos, I think, is the best answer <laughs> that. Yep, okay. um, yeah, I'm not the best at that. I, I do live out of a Google Calendar these days, and so my weekday is pretty much stacked back to back meetings. Um, yep. But in terms of like uh, after the nine to five, how you juggle um, all the different projects that I've got working on, how you prioritize them, like what's the video of the week or whatever, like a lot of that is by the seat of my pants, not very organized. It's just, hey, I have an hour free. Cool. Let's figure out some use of it and move some project forward, basically. Yeah. But do you have a routine every day that helps you? Like, do you wake up at a certain time, do certain things before you go to work or you just free flow it? Um, well, I mean, I, I do keep a sleep schedule, but aside from that, not much. Um, okay. I got, a you know, a, a certain, certain time of the day, uh, when the meetings usually start a certain time of the day when they usually stop. Um, and then, uh, afterwards, like, I, th I think especially in the pandemic where, you know, I don't have a partner or anything like that. I'm just alone in this, uh, yeah. in this little box with my cat. Um, I think it's, it's definitely like, uh, whenever I have free time, which these days is a lot, um, I just find some project and move it forward a little bit and don't really keep to a strict schedule with that kind of stuff. Not as, as probably strict as I should be. And then certain projects, which I think are going to go out on a, on a certain date, end up going out, you know, six months later or something like that. Or yeah. I get pressured to push something out sooner because, you know, a conference accepts it. And then, you know, all of a sudden drop everything, work on just that. Um, I, I could do better on the, on the, like uh, scheduling and the the routine side of things, I'm not I'm not the best at that stuff. Yeah, the routine thing I'm curious to hear because some people are just like I don't need a routine. I'm good with it without one. I've realized I need to have a routine of when I go to bed, when I wake up. The waking up part is a little bit difficult <laughs> a lot of times, but I did realize I started uh, for three weeks. I experimented with like waking up at six thirty every day. And that really helped me, but also it's six fucking thirty in the morning. Yeah. I don't know if I want to wake up six thirty because by the time I go to work at nine, you know, nine ish, I feel more productive. My brain's fully awake to do everything, but it's just like I just gotta go to bed earlier, give up some personal time, and wake up early. It just feels good, but at the same time, it's such an investment. So actually, since you brought it up, this is something I did, you know, years ago, way before the pandemic. Was I I threw away my alarm clock, metaphorical alarm clock, I guess, because everybody uses their phone these days. But yeah. I don't I don't have something that wakes me up in the morning. Um, and I think that, you know, will just give me so much energy throughout the day because I, I didn't, you know, force myself to get up. Uh, my body just naturally woke me up. But the flip side to that is you have to go to bed early enough where you're waking up at a reasonable hour to to catch that first thing in the morning of work or meetings or whatever it happens. To have be. you missed any meetings because of this? At, the um, at least, <laughs> I'll tell you that I have. I forget to set up my alarm and I don't wake up. <laughs> I, I decline to answer that <laughs> particular question. <laughs> but I don't know if if you're really on top of it, your body actually is pretty good at giving you like plus or minus thirty minutes or something like yeah. that. And as long as you're going to bed early enough, um, that's fine. But it's just every once in a while, some wrench will get thrown in the mix, and you'll you'll be up late because you're at you know, somebody's uh, birthday thing or whatever, and right, then right. it'll just mess up your whole week. That rhythm will get screwed up, and then your body, even three days later, will wake you up at the wrong time, and you just got to get back into it. Yeah, when I, I realize, like, because of how long I've done this routine thing, when I forget to set up my alarm, I still kind of wake up around the same time. You know, by, like, 8 o'clock, I'm awake. 
but it's just mostly being able to push myself to wake up early. And I've also realized like a lot of times when you wake up and you, you're tired, you're not tired. You're telling yourself you're tired. Mm-hmm. You've had you've had seven hours of sleep. You don't need more than that. Like eight hours, seven hours is enough. Sometimes you want to catch up on some sleep. Fine. Right. But it's just you telling yourself you're tired and not wanting to wake up. Um, <laughs> so I want to wake up three days late to a meeting. That's funny. Uh, but yeah, man, I just wanted to uh, kind of see like how you manage your time just because, it's again. I'm hearing what other people other people do. How I can improve my personal uh, life based on things I worked out for people. I'm gonna try the alarm thing one day. I'm gonna I'm gonna do an experiment of a week of like not setting up any alarms. Uh, I'll tell you that I started charging my phone uh, downstairs. So my kitchen's downstairs in my house. I charge it downstairs, and for some reason I sleep better. Yeah. I don't wake up and like do the one eye thing at my phone. Like, do I have any notifications at like 4 a.m.? You know, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, Reddit, whatever you're into. I don't have that anymore. Or even like looking at what time it is. I just wake up and I go, it's still dark out. I'm going back to sleep. Right. Uh, That was a huge improvement in my sleep. Or especially if, you know, you don't have notifications turned off and you you hear that buzz at 8 a.m. in the morning or something. You're like, oh, notification. Somebody just sent me something, you know. Gotta go check it or whatever. Yeah, having it downstairs and like waking up. I have my iPad upstairs that I use for my my personal stuff. Um, but just having it downstairs when I wake up, you know, social media is not the first thing in my face. Uh, deleting Twitter app was great. I don't have to worry about any notifications anymore. I use the browser to go to Twitter, post whatever it is. But those small things add up. For sure. Yeah. So what do you use for an alarm clock then? You have like an old fashioned. I have my iPad and I have a um I have my iPad I use. I put so I used to be one of those people. Let me show you this. I want to show you how bad I used to be with like sleeping for a while, like All waking right. up in the morning. Ready? Please don't judge me if you see this on YouTube. <laughs> but this used to be my alarm clock. I have a alarm <laughs> for every like, you know, five minutes to wake up. Right? And at one point, I was like, dude, what are you doing? Like, what's happening here? Why do I have to have, like, eight alarms to wake up by 6.30 or 7? And that's that's not real sleep either. You know, if you're getting right. two minutes between alarms, like, you're not actually get, gaining anything out of that. You're just... So I set up one alarm on my iPad, and I put my iPad across the room. So I have to physically get up and go turn it off. And then by the time you get up, it's just like, I don't want to go back to bed. I'm not going to fall asleep anymore, right? Um, that was very helpful, not having the phone... Because like you can also wake up and say, I'm going to grab my phone and just sleep, lay down and go on my phone kind of a thing. I can't mm-hmm. do that. I got to go all the way downstairs. And then if I go down and get my, um, <laughs> people think that's alarming. Um, but if I have to go downstairs and get my phone, I have a puppy downstairs. She's not going to go back to sleep. So like, I have a whole setup of alarms right now going on. But I did one alarm. I did. Um, I read this book called um, The Miracle Morning, I think is what it's called. I really recommend reading it. If you're watching this, you're into reading books, you know, um, self-growth books that's all i read and that book that and um another book i'll mention in a bit but that book really makes you question how your brain works because it tells you like you, like what i said you you're telling yourself you're tired you're not tired you slept eight hours there's no what there's no way you're tired it's just you want to have that excuse to go to bed and it tells you like if you have a routine in the mornings and you look forward to your routine because it helps you then you want to wake up early so I wake up at six thirty, walk my dog, do all these things. Like walking my dog isn't something I want to do really in the morning, but knowing that she's gonna be tired for the rest of the day and not bug me while I work, it's a reward of itself, right? And then can't hurt me by David Goggins. I know if I say that a lot of people in the chat probably read it. Uh, I've talked about it a bunch of times. That guy also, he's a Marines. He calls you out on all your excuses and just tells you everything you, you're telling yourself it's in your brain and I'm a proof of it. Cause he, you know, he took the Marines, um, exam in the water thing with pneumonia and he still did it. And he was saying, look, I did it with pneumonia. Hmm. You can, your body could handle a lot more if you prepare yourself and like you train your brain to do it. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a good point. I've never been in armed services or anything like that, but I definitely do think a piece of it is just discipline. Like to your point of when the alarm goes off and you know, you don't want to get up or something like that. Like you could definitely probably, discipline your mind to overcome that um but yeah that is kind of funny you've got like the dog alarm clock is one of your your fallbacks is like your your dog is functioning as the uh as as that motivating force when she goes to sleep i go to sleep when i come down when she sees me she gets excited and she's a husky and huskies are not quiet right they they, they like to talk so that's my other way if i go down there she sees me i have to stay awake what's your dog's name 
Coco. Coco. Nice. <laughs> yeah, she was supposed to be a mix. And he was like, oh, it's going to look cute with a uh, Coco. And then turned out 100% was lied to, and she's 100% a husky. Nice. Does she, uh, will she howl if you howl at her? You know, like give her a good. Ooh. She, she gives, she howls on her own. We argue okay. a lot, man. We argue a lot. <laughs> um, she likes to, you know, when I make her sit to come inside, she howls. I've never heard her bark, but she howls and whines a lot. And she's very vocal. Nice. But it's a perk of having a husky, unfortunately. But she's a really, really good dog. Very cool. Well, man, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. As always, it's very cool to have you on here, dude. I'm going to start using Truffle Hog, and I'm going to do the alarm thing for a week at some point and let you know how it went. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other than that, anything you want to share, any uh, exciting news, anything you're looking forward to you're going to release, you want to tease people about, anything you want to plug maybe for the, for the YouTube and people that are watching live? Yeah, so all I can say is like now that um, myself and a small team are working on this full time, we have a ton of open source stuff that we're going to be throwing out there in the next couple of months. Um, so definitely make sure to follow uh, TruffleSec as um, the company behind it, myself and Secure Nature, and we are going to blast it all over the place when those things are ready. And I'll, I'll do my best to do, uh, you know, YouTube videos, 30 minute talks. I don't know if people realize how, uh, you know, how much energy can go into making really good video content, but it's, it's no. a ton of effort. So if, if I can find the time, I'll try to make videos with that stuff as well, but, uh, but definitely stay, stay tuned. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the next couple of months where we're just going to be able to give so much back to the community. For sure. Well, Hey, thanks again for being here, man. And I look forward to seeing all your, uh, upcoming work. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Cheers, man. See ya. All right. That's it. I see a lot of love in the chat. I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for all the awesome comments and the words of encouragement. I'll put some of that on the screen. All right. That's it. I am going to go hang out with my family a little bit more. Uh, I got to go visit some of my family members. But um, next week, Vicky Lee. I know uh, Dylan mentioned her a few times, but Vicky's going to be back up here on uh, next Sunday for another episode of uh, Live Recon. I don't know if we'll do any recon, but we'll see about that. Other than that, enjoy your night, enjoy your evening, enjoy your afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, come to Discord, hang out with us on Discord, and I will see you all next week. Peace.